Hello and welcome to Reporting In. This is the TYT member show, at least members get it first before the general public, where we talk about the topic of investigative journalism. I talk to reporters who work not only for the Young Turks, but also in the larger world, reporting on stories that are interesting and compelling, but maybe don't get as much attention as they should. And I talk to those reporters and we get the, the story behind the story, ideally. And today on the show, I'm really excited because uh, we're going to talk to Natasha Leonard, and if you are unfamiliar with her work for The Intercept, she is a columnist for The Intercept. She's written for The Nation, for Esquire, The New Inquiry, and The New York Times, among other uh, outlets. She also is a teacher in the Creative Publishing and Critical Journalism graduate program at the New School in New York City. And she has two books, not just one, but two books coming out. Uh, one in November, Violence, Humans in Dark Times, she wrote with Brad Evans. And another one called Being Numerous, which I don't know as much about, but I'm going to find out later. But first, Natasha, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the show and, uh, and speaking with me today. Hi, Malcolm. Thank you. Nice to virtually be here. Uh, terrific. So uh, specifically, what I wanted to talk to you about today is a story you wrote in The Intercept about a recent uh, nation, well, not nationwide, but multi-city strike among specifically McDonald's workers and uh, the where they were striking not for higher wages or the usual uh, uh, complaints of those fast food workers, but specifically about sexual harassment in the workplace and how they are sort of marrying the Me Too movement and the Fight for 15. Uh, so that's what we're, we're the substance of what we're going to talk about. But first, I wanted to our viewers are if they're unfamiliar with your work, I wanted to find out a little bit about your background, how you got into journalism in the first place, and found yourself working at the Intercept and covering the kind of stories you do. So, what's the what's your elevator elevator speech on uh, on how you got to where you are today? Um, so, uh, as is kind of very audible, I grew up in England, um, have a background in analytic philosophy. Came to New York for journalism grad school, um, was pretty involved in the Occupy movement, um, both as a reporter originally and then um, an activist. And that uh, kind of led me towards uh, a focus on opinion and essay writing and social justice reporting. And from that, you know, I've worked at a number of places, a few couple of miserable years at Vice, but otherwise otherwise happy, and um, have had a number of columns, and now have my column at The Intercept, where I really like working and looking at um, issues of power, essentially, and how they operate in society, and how power is challenged, and so that can be through social justice, criminal justice, um, labor organizing, um, uh, anti-racist, anti-fascist movements, and feminism, so it's a sort of Venn diagram of issues that I like to yeah, look at. Yeah, if, if you're, if you're going to use uh, the, you know, power as your umbrella, <laughs> then that gives you license to talk about almost anything, really. Uh, yeah, so, um, from the left, naturally. From the, right, <laughs> right, of course. Uh, and, and what is your, and you teach at the New School in uh, Manhattan. Uh, yes. What And what are you teach, what you are, are you on the faculty there, or are you visiting, for, what do you, what do you, and what do you teach? I'm, I'm part-time faculty and I teach um, critical journalism, which is not sort of formally a thing, but it's essentially a journalism school graduate program that takes it upon itself to challenge presumptions about this lionized fourth estate. So oh. a kind of different approach to the standard um, journalism schools that often presume journalism is already being done right. So we like to take to task um, presumptions about truth finding and um, the way that kind of New York Times has often operated is often a site of critique that I like to enter into. Um, so giving students a sense of what the media ecosystem is and what kind of sets of facts that leads to being produced and proliferated. That's a, That sounds super interesting to me because I imagine that that's not, as you pointed, not typical at journalism schools. And uh, Although you're not exactly setting up your students to get jobs at the Washington Post and the New York Times necessarily too well, if you're you have a yeah, whole yeah. course talk, talking about how they're not really doing journalism there, uh, maybe your your this 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 uh, this class is uh, the path to penury, how to not right. make, never make any money as a journalist. <laughs> not that well, you know, even if they were trying to go work in the mainstream, they wouldn't make any money anyway. And and why would they be at the New School? I must ask. So you know, <laughs> yeah, I guess that I guess that's true. But I think that's really that's super. I, I'd love to talk to you about that too, because like how you uh, use the New York Times as an example of poor journalism when the vast majority of Americans and the, the common conception of the New York Times is this is the height of journalism and the very best. And the idea that you would even critique the New York Times as not doing good journalism is you know oh my stars oh. <laughs> I, 
Where's my fainting couch? Um, so, uh, uh, so, but I, I, but that's not what we're here, we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about <laughs> the McDonald's strike, and that's you know I'm, I'm not going to bait and switch you much as I would would like to. And also, I you know I would love to get your your thoughts on. I assume you keep up with what's going on in Great Britain with the political scene there, and that is fascinating on a day to day basis uh, as well. So I guess we're just going to have to have you back numerous times in the future to talk about all these things. But for now, sure. so tell me about the the McDonald's strike and the recent McDonald's strike where what the genesis of it was where it came from where the workers went on strike and what they uh -huh. were what their what were their demands and, uh, and how did it, how did it come about in the first place um so just to give a sort of brief timeline the the strike itself was last tuesday um and it was as you mentioned the first multi-state strike specifically that took it's to, that it, who's which tar which targeted specifically sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, restaurant service workers are some of the most vulnerable to sexual harassment, both from co-workers and customers. Um, a recent survey, uh, I think from 2014, found that 80% of women in the service industry have um, been uh, sexually assaulted or harassed in some way over their careers, 60% on a monthly basis. And also so had... Um, in terms of over their careers, 50% of men. Um, but these are also industries in which uh, the vast majority of the, the workers are women. Right. Um, so this has been a, a you know a plague uh, for people working in these these low paid precarious jobs that they're not able to lose. Um, and there had been a number of complaints filed. Um, and McDonald's has always insisted that it is a zero tolerance of sexual harassment corporation. But that doesn't really mean much when no specific actions are taken after years of complaints being filed. Um, so I think after this continuous effort to go through, you know, the appropriate um, channel within the corporation. Um, I think, you know, workers were feeling like that this isn't working and there needs to be uh, a, a stronger push and, you know, what do workers have but leveraging, you know, their labor time. Um, so what happened is there were already um, monthly meetings in numerous cities um, with, organized by female McDonald's workers. And through these meetings and interactions between people who are organizing in these meetings, um, some of whom already worked with the Fight for 15 movement. The plan was made to go on a, a one day strike, a walkout at midday. Um, and this was in 10 cities, um, sadly not New York, but um, I think one of the originating points was uh, Missouri. Uh, and, and St. Louis, and I have this written down somewhere so I can. <laughs> it's all, it's all right. But they were they were mostly Sorry. midwestern cities, I, mostly as I Midwest. recall, and and they they were sort of uh, uh, you know traditional American cities that uh, we think of as a sort of heartland. I guess Chicago, Kansas City, and I you know but yeah. So there but there were ten cities, and this was a and. Uh, what? But you didn't know uh, when you wrote the article. It was before the the strike had happened, and so you didn't know uh, how sizable it was going to be, and whether what their expectations were versus what the results were, were going to look like. So, what uh, what were the results? Did were they as expected? Did uh, how many people walked out, and was it uh, did it get any public attention or press, at least even locally? It, it certainly, I think it, you know, it, it in fact got got a reasonable amount of national press, and the the walkout numbers were in their were in their thousands. It's very hard to calculate because people walk out at midnight, midday, and it's not like it doesn't mean that entire shops are closed, but a number of entire franchises were shut for the day. And just in the in terms of the planning meetings, there were a number of hundred people, and I think that's a very relevant factor because these are people that are going to continue organizing and working um, and using models that have proven successful, um, not only in this specific effort with relating to sexual harassment, that's pretty new, um, but in the fight for 15 right. um, and then in the fight for uh, higher wages. And that this strike, um, which was a wildcat strike, uh, McDonald's workers are not allowed to unionize in this country. McDonald's is famously anti-union. Um, 
And so this was a wildcat strike, which obviously carries its, its risks. Um, and the, but the demands were very, very specific. And for a corporation of McDonald's size, certainly not difficult to implement. But that's, you know, never really the determining factor as to whether corporations do things. Oh, um, yeah. People wouldn't have to strike if they did. Um, what what were the demands, if I may ask? Did they, did they had specific demands the, from the companies, uh, like... Uh, yeah. policies they wanted implemented and, you know, more than just lip service. I love, you know, they, they say they have zero tolerance for sexual harassment in the workplace. Turns out they have zero tolerance for sexual harassment claims in the workplace. It's just a one word difference, but right. it does, it does make a difference. Right. Though. It does make, it does sort of shift the entire meaning of the sentence. And I, so the, the demands were simply, um, of which makes sense, uh, mandatory cha- training, mandatory sexual harassment training for all workers, um, employees and bosses, um, shift managers uh, at every level of uh, the employee ladder, um, for there to be a committee created, um, a national committee to specifically address these issues, and that include employees themselves and not just upper management, and for there to be a, um, a hotline that workers can call um, without any fear of retribution. Um so that they don't necessarily have to go to a kind of federal agency to launch a complaint, but nor does it have to stay within the remit of going directly through their managers, who in certain cases are the harassers themselves. Um, so these are really, really basic asks. Um, and it's appalling that they haven't already been in place. Um, and I think part of the reason is that, you know, as we, as we mentioned, these workers aren't unionized. So it is harder to have leverage. And it's also harder without a union to know exactly where is a safe space to put these complaints. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, the hotline would would be a kind of weak placeholder for something like that, that there could be a union's job. But, um, you know, uh, given that that's not a possibility for these workers right now, the action they're taking is brave and sensible. Yeah, I mean, I, I you profile in the article a, a woman by the name of Kimberly Lawson, who's one of the leaders. She makes nine dollars an hour at a Missouri yeah. McDonald's, and she has a lot. She has everything to lose, and uh, the people who put it on the line, their their their, uh, uh, their livelihoods on the line for this sort of thing. It, it it shows not only their courage but also the severity of the problem because they're not going to take these risks lightly. Uh, yeah, and and they and Kimberly was very kind of assertive in that she was she. There is a lot at stake, but she was fearless, and indeed, there is a lot at stake to not handle these problems. You know. Well, and it seems to me it's obvious why McDonald's and other corporations would not want to even give an inch because this is, you know, even if they, you know, they, they see that the next logical steps lead towards unionization, and that is something that they want to avoid at all costs. We're, lo- we're losing yeah. you. We're we losing you. Sorry, no, it's just <laughs> my my. Um, my computer was needs a charge. Earthquake I'm, in New York <laughs> City. You're getting it here first. I'm, I'm reporting in. Uh, there's an earthquake in the labor movement in America, <laughs> and it's coming for you, McDonald's. And this is just a metaphor. What what is happening to uh, to Natasha's camera there? Uh, but the one right. thing I wanted, to, but uh, that I think is really super interesting about this, uh, the aspect of this story that the the idea of bringing uh, the the Me Too movement to uh, the working class, the working people of America, is that there's been this sort of irony where the, I don't want to say the victims, the, the people who get caught up in the net primarily of the Me Too movement have been high profile, famous people who uh, we can launch Twitter wars again. You know, Harvey Weinstein, we can all go after him. Everyone knows who that is, or uh, or Bill Cosby, for example. But uh, you can't, the, if, you, uh, if your assistant manager at the Arby's where you work at in Lubbock, Texas, is sexually harassing you, uh, you you're not going to, I mean, I'm not, not to say that, you know, Hollywood celebrities aren't going to be supportive of you and we're all going to rally around you, but it's, it's less likely. And your complaints are going to fall on deaf ears. And so uh, the question is, how do we uh, take this, this momentum of, uh, uh, that we're going to take seriously the question, the issues of sexual harassment but uh, broaden them to incorporate everybody in, in the United States at all levels of society. And by marrying it to the fight for 15 and, and uh, I guess depicting it as a, a part of a, a larger picture of exploitation of workers, uh, it, it brings more attention it's, it, because it's not just, oh, fight for 15, they just want more, more money, typical labor union or labor complaint. And you know, the, the, company will, the companies will try to quash it. Uh, but when they add the Me Too movement and sexual harassment, 
that uh, I think touches a real nerve uh, uh, and is a more universal experience uh, to to gain sympathy for them. And are you seeing is that is that uh, effective? Is it being effective? Do you think as a as a stratagem? Well, I mean, I feel like it's. Um you know, effective, effective towards what? You always have to finish that sentence, I think. And um, clearly, if Me Too is to be something we want to call a movement rather than a moment with some victories, like any movement, it, it requires a diversity of tactics. And the tactics deployed by someone with a large Twitter following who already has uh, some power and fame themselves will obviously be different from an individual or vast number of McDonald's workers who can only act as collectively. And we also have to think about targets. We are talking about workplace harassment in every one of these cases, be it on the casting couch or be it in McDonald's, but obviously workplaces work differently. And Harvey Weinstein is an individual. What's interesting about the McDonald's workers is they are taking on a corporation. And, you know, there are, the history of workers taking on corporations is, an, is, is a long history of struggle. And so uh, and that's why I think it's appropriate that we are talking about strike action here um, and that this is a workplace issue and this is a power issue. Um, so we are talking about taking on systems of power in which a number of workers, be they famous actresses or shift workers in McDonald's, are not actually in a position of power compared to the patriarchal forces over them. Right. Um, so there's obviously that through line, but the same tactics can't be used and can't apply. And, you know, we are seeing, we are, it's not that we're not seeing solidarity. So when um, 700,000 farm workers signed on to a letter to say, we support you, Me Too movement, when it first uh, got a lot of public spotlight because of actresses. Um, the presumption and the ask was, if you support us too. And to an extent, we have seen that because the Time's Up Fund, which is a legal fund, which a number of the um, actresses who first came out against Weinstein have supported and added serious funding to, these Time's Up legal funds are going to the legal cases that um, low-income workers are taking up against their employers. Mm. Um, so a number of the complaints filed by McDonald's workers that were the precursor to this strike, money from the Time's Up fund was used to bring legal defense into those cases. So there is, a, there is a kind of connection and solidarity we're seeing here. But of course, if this is going to be ongoing and we're going to take seriously the role sexual harassment plays in the political economy, then it is going to have to be a workers' movement. And it's going to have to pay attention to a fact that is so often overlooked that if we want to talk about the working class today, we are talking about a lot of what is known as you know, feminized labor, service yeah. work, yeah. domestic work. Um, and these are the sites that we have to be looking at and the struggles that people in this labor face. And a key one is sexual harassment. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, and it's that is a good what you talk about with Time's Up and supporting legal. That's a good sign of solidarity. And I mean, but when you talk about solidarity, uh, the real solidarity is among the corporate class and the, the companies that are not interested in giving uh, uh, their worker, you know, not not more money, obviously, but also they don't even want to start this ball rolling. And it seems like the you, you highlight this in your article. The additional challenge, in, besides not being unionized among uh, fast food workers, is the the franchise model that uh, that persists uh, or it pertains in the in the fast food industry, where uh, McDonald's, for example, can. They say, well, we, you know, they, they, they'll issue a statement saying, oh, well, we, we, you know, uh, uh, we believe all of our franchisees share our values and our belief in, you know, zero tolerance for sexual harassment. Uh, but then when it happens, they say, well, they're a franchisee. We don't tell them what to do. So they, you know, they're on their own and your, your issue is with them. And it seems like it's, it's sort of part and parcel of the larger movement towards uh, eliminating employees uh, and having in, you know independent contractors like with Uber, for example, where the company can uh, can maintain a, a plausible deniability that they have any responsibility for what their 
uh, franchisees or what the company is doing uh, at the, at the, on the front lines to their workers, but they also, at the same time, can tell those franchisees exactly what to do and how tall their signs should be and what they're promoting this week and da 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 da, da right? So, uh, so does the does the franchise model does that uh, uh, is that insurmountable? Well, you can't be insurmountable, but how do you overcome that and make McDonald's take responsibility when they claim that they don't they shouldn't have to? Well, I mean, the the point is they will they will continue to hide behind this, and this has been one of the um, the kind of excuses they point to when they have rejected calls for unions. Um, but I mean, what, how do you overcome this? You just keep directly targeting the corporation itself. You make the strikes not about a given franchise, but you make them multi-city, multi-state wide to make clear that your target is the corporation. It's not the one franchise in Kansas City. Um, and so I think as long as as long as the political action makes clear that no activists and workers won't buy that. This is a corporation that, as you say, is able to tweak every little detail of consumer experience to push its products. Of course, it's able to listen to the demands of the worker and implement better corporate-wide, company-wide practices relating to sexual harassment. Um, so I just think, you know, refusing to swallow those excuses, which, you know, none of these strikers have um, is the only way forward. Well, we're almost done, but I, I wanted to just find out if there have there been any repercussions. Uh, have has anybody lost their job? Have, have no. they returned to work? Or and what's the future hold? Is are there going to be more strikes planned, or is that to, to be determined? I think that's to be determined. There hasn't been any retribution that I've heard of in terms of job loss. Um, and it was you know it was one afternoon strike and fight for fifteen as a movement, has seen a number of these with, with varying successes, uh, often depending on context. For example, they were instrumental in uh, helping the Disney workers, who are unionized, and that makes a difference, um, actually get the $15 minimum wage. Um, so I think with that in mind, this is an ongoing movement. And the women I spoke to um, who, are, who helped organize the strike didn't have plans in place for and another follow-up, but we'll, will certainly be continuing to meet every month, which were the conditions of possibility for the strike in the first place. So we certainly haven't heard the end of their efforts, demands, and activism. Well, I appreciate your writing the article and following up and, and covering the story because it's it really highlights the, uh, the exploitation that women primarily, uh, but not exclusively, in the service industry, and specifically McDonald's, but it's broad, it's true across the board in the service industries, how much that they are exploited, and not only for their labor, but also for their their bodies themselves, and that that they are fighting back. It's indicative of how serious the problem is, but also it is encouraging. And so I'm I'm glad to shine a light on it. Before we go, though, I, as I promised at the beginning, uh, you, were, you you mentioned power, and I'm guessing that your new book coming out, Violence: Humans in Dark Times, has something to do with power. Am I right? Um, it does. It's actually a series of, of long form interviews that Brad Evans, who is a British philosopher, and I carried out, um, some of which were originally published haha, in The New York Times. Um, <laughs> but they are it's talking to a number of philosophers, thinkers, artists about the subject of violence, violence and protest, violence and aesthetics, violence and race, violence and how corpses are visualized, violence and mass environmental destruction violence and post-humanism. So it's a huge spread, each of which tries to reconceptualize the idea of violence that is all too under-theorized, I think, in today's media landscape. So, you know, lots of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a great beach read. Yeah, no, yeah. Exactly. but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's discrete chapters which are each their own interview. So actually quite good to keep by the loo, is my pitch. <laughs> that's, there's, that, that's what I refer to as my library. Um, but so, uh, well, okay, it's called Violence, Humans in Dark Times. It comes out in November. Uh, yeah. Look for that. It, it sounds really interesting to me. Uh, you know, now I want to take your class and read your book. Uh, and, but, and what, just briefly, what about being numerous? What is that? That's coming out in May. What's that going to um, be about? What, yeah, what can we look that, forward to from that? That is a uh, book of essays, some of which, again, have already been written. So it's not that impressive that I have two books coming out. Um, but it's with Verso Publishers, who are fantastic, and the full title is being numerous essays on non-fascist life. And it is a collection of essays that look at largely how a lot of uh, centrist liberal ideology is 
failing based on presumptions of enlightenment ideology to deal with the rise of fascism and certain fascist nationalisms we're seeing now um, and trying to give that a philosophical undergirding um, such that we end up understanding the necessity of punching the odd Nazi um, is my <laughs> elevator pitch for that. See, now that's, see, that, that, that should have been the title. The title should be, you gotta punch the odd Nazi. You, you know, know what? Essays on blah, 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 or, or punching the odd Nazi. But all, all Nazis are a little odd, they're, you know. Um, but <laughs> anyway, listen, I appreciate your talking to me about this. I don't mean to make light of these. Uh, these are really serious and important stories, and I appreciate you covering them. And hopefully, you know, as the, the story progresses and, and if there are more actions, we can, you can write about it, you'll write about it again, and we can have you on again. But in the meantime, thank you, Natasha Leonard. The book coming out in November, Violence, Humans, and Dark Times in, uh, in May, being numerous. And, uh, and thanks so much for talking to me, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, and uh, for those of you at home, thank you so much for watching, reporting in. It, members, you get the show first, then the general public, but you get access to it first, because you're special. We appreciate your membership. If you know anybody else you think would be, like to be a member of TYT, maybe a gift membership for them. Holidays are coming up. Of course, they always are, I mean, really. So, uh, so thank you for watching. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed the conversation with Natasha Leonard, and you'll tune in next time as well. Thanks a lot.